Hey everyone, this is Kirk here again from Option Alpha and welcome back to the nightly video update. Tonight I want to go through our new VIX hedging strategy. This video, until we create a more detailed video, although I think this video is going to be pretty detailed in going through it, um, but until we create a different video, this video is going to act as the reference video that you're going to want to use if you are entertaining the use of the VIX hedging strategy. So. Full disclosure, this is a strategy that I am doing in my portfolio. You obviously do not have to do this strategy. This is what I choose to do with my own account, my own money. I'll walk through kind of things that I would do in certain scenarios, obviously. Um, if I had a smaller account, if I had larger accounts or whatever the case is, this is something that uh, we will continue to do moving forward um, and definitely something that I will continue to do in my portfolio moving forward. Um, we actually started this about a month ago with the first round of this and then we're making a slight tweak here because we've just continued to get a lot of data and basically for the last month or so we've been really like going through this and combing it and looking at strategies and ways we can do this and i think what we uh finally figured out and what we came up with is uh, a really really good strategy uh one that i'm very excited about uh for the two components that it includes um it's a little bit more complicated than the original strategy that we had uh issued but at the time i had issued that i said look it's a subject to change subject to review if we get more data, if we find out something different, and uh, that's basically what happens. So uh, quickly, we are adjusting course here a little bit and kind of tweaking what we do by adding a different component to the hedging strategy. Again, like I said, this is full disclosure, what I'm doing for my portfolio. You don't have to do this. This helps me um, with our positions. It helps me believe that we can curb some of the tail risk that's out there. I don't think that we'll be able to eliminate risk to the downside. I don't think that's possible to do but I think we can curb some of the far tail risk um, along the way. And that's the whole idea with this is that I don't want to find myself in a situation where we go through uh, 25 or 30 or 40 or 50 or plus percent drawdown. So I'm okay with uh, you know 10 to 15, 20% drawdown in the portfolio. That's fine. I'd like to avoid those, but that's fine if that happens. This is not what this is for. This is for the long tail end of the spectrum, the stuff that um, will eventually come back to the market and has slowly kind of peaked its head into the market uh, here and there over the last couple of months in the last two and a half years or so. So the reason I like this strategy is because it helps curb some of that. It gives me the freedom, I think, to start allocating more aggressively with option selling premium. And that's the whole idea with this is uh, to help curb that tail risk. So the new strategy includes two components. I want to go through both of those components tonight. Again, I want to try to touch on a lot of this as possible, as much of this as possible, honestly. Um, in this video update because I want this to be the the standard that you look at as kind of understanding the strategy. The strategy basically has two components and the way that I think about these two components are the first component is basically the the short-term spikes. Um, so I call them ST, um, STS basically, I guess is what you would call them. So uh, short-term spikes in volatility. And so the reason that I think that this is important, and I'll get to you, get to it in here in a second, is that what we haven't seen since 2008 is we haven't seen really a spike above 40-ish on the VIX. Um, and that's mainly because actually the VIX pricing structure went through a change after 2008. So I think it's possible for sure that if we go through another major meltdown like we had in 2008, 2007, we're going to see the VIX spike up. But what we haven't seen during that time period is that these little down moves in the market that have obviously been... Uh, big moves, sometimes 10%, sometimes 17%, sometimes 9%. Those types of moves, I think, create an opportunity that we could hedge the portfolio during those times and also potentially uh, run a profit on some of these trades. So that's component one. number one is short-term spikes. Um, component number two, as I mentioned in the trade commentary, uh, is what we're calling and one, one of our guys named this the doomsday hedge. Um, and this is really what the original component of the VIX hedge was and still remains to be, is a hedge on the very long tail end of the VIX profile that would profit if we saw a massive move up in volatility. And the reason we call this doomsday hedge is because I don't want to underemphasize when this thing would actually work or, or overemphasize the fact that you would have a profit on this thing if you got a, a spike up in volatility. What we're looking for on this tail end of the spectrum is we're looking for massive increases in volatility. To me, this would be VIX north of 50, which we haven't seen pretty much since 2008. So, so that's what it's there for. And again, to me personally, this is a required component that I will have in my portfolio because I am willing to pay the small notional amount that it's going to cost 
to maintain that doomsday hedge um, in order to give myself ongoing consistent protection against the worst case scenario. Because the worst case scenario may only happen once or twice in my lifetime, may only happen once in my lifetime, but once is too much. Um, and that's why I don't want it to, uh, to happen to my portfolio. Like I said, this is how I'm running my thing. Um, you can obviously adjust and make changes as you see fit. So the two components, like I said, short-term uh, spikes is really that first one. And then, um, you know, really this is just like long tail. You can call this the doomsday, but it really is like the furthest end of the spectrum kind of long tail. So the first component that I wanna go through here is basically what we're calling a bull uh, call ladder, or you can call it bear call ladder, however you see it. Uh, but it's basically a custom order. And that's really what it ultimately ends up being. The goal of the custom order is to do two things basically. It is to enter a position that has long volatility exposure. Uh, so that's the first component that we wanted as a requirement. That's that's natural, right? We want long volatility exposure in case volatility in the VIX explodes. And then the second component that we want is we want it to be basically costless. So I'll just put like CL for costless. We don't want to uh, target paying any money to get into this position. I'll tell you why here in a second. But that means that we have to do a little bit of maneuvering around each expiration period. And this means that each expiration period that we run into or each cycle of trades that we run into is gonna be slightly different than the next. Um, in some cases, the spreads might be a little bit wider. In some cases, the spreads might be a little bit more narrow. But again, the whole goal here is to have a position that is net long volatility and is cost less. And I'll talk about here in a minute if you decide to go with a small debit, you can also do that too, but we are gonna be targeting a cost less position. And the reason that's gotta be costless is because we wanna minimize drag as much as possible. So the problem that I see with just doing everything on the doomsday hedge is that literally you're going to have a very consistent drag for many years until a doomsday event happens. Um, and that's okay if you're willing to accept that. I think I was willing to accept most of that, but not all of it. So this component that we're having now spread out between these two VIX hedges uh, allows us to get a little bit of both. It allows us to get kind of that short-term volatility spike and it allows us to get still exposure into long tail doomsday type uh, scenarios, okay? So this custom position is basically built the following way. And so again, follow along, along on this closely because it's not that complicated, honestly. I'm gonna draw it out here on the chart because I think that's really the best way to do it. Uh, but the first thing that you're gonna do is you're gonna sell a short call option that's around an 80 delta. So that's where we're basically targeting. It doesn't have to be exactly 80 delta, but you're basically targeting an 80 delta option. And that's really the starting point of this strategy is a short call option. That short call option on the VIX probably will not be in the money just the way the VIX pricing structure works. If it was a regular single you know, call option on a stock or an ETF, that would obviously be a deep in the money option. On the VIX, not so much. Could be right at the money, could be slightly in the money. Most likely it's gonna be out of the money for VIX. But you're gonna sell an 80 delta option, which is gonna be pretty close. The next thing that you're gonna do is you're going to buy an out of the money option to create a spread. So this is where you basically buy this out of the money option that basically creates this initial first kind of spread. And I'll just put like dot, dot, dots here because we'll kind of fill in the gaps in between here for a second. But the original position again is to sell a 80 strike option. In this case, our example here today is the 17 strike uh, call options on the VIX. And then you're gonna buy a further out option that completes the spread and basically just is a very simple bear call spread. So this is the, the main component of it is this bear call spread that you're doing. You're doing this all for a net credit. Now obviously you're doing it for a net credit because you're selling at the money options very close you're buying something that's a little bit further away, so selling something really close, buying something that's a little bit further away, and you're doing this all for a net credit. Now in this case, the net credit that we took in on this, this first component is $195, okay? So we took in a net credit between this one and this one of $195. Now that credit, we are going to then use that credit to buy an option that is lower than our long call strike. In some cases, and this is where it is gonna get subjective as we go through different expiration months, so please hear me on this as I say this, we want it to be lower, ideally, as low as possible, but we also can be doubling up at the same strike if we want to. That's not ideal, so we could do another 24 call option, but ideally we want it to be lower, and by having it lower, it reduces some of the risk in the position. I'll show you here in a second as we get on the 
the payoff diagram and we start building this out. But again, the idea here is you sell the spread. And so this is the first leg that you sell. You buy another leg, which kind of flattens out the payoff diagram, right? Traditionally, a long call option or short call option payoff diagram would go like this. But you buy that option contract just to kind of flatten out that payoff diagram at some point. And then you take the additional credit that you have now used or collected and you go in here and you physically buy another long put option at a lower strike. And what that does is it starts to actually tilt the graph this direction. And that's what actually gets us our long volatility exposures, that additional doubling up, if you will, on long call options. So we basically have two long call options. We have one short option that's at the money. You're very close to the money. And we're trying to do this all for a net credit, okay? So that's the whole idea. So I wanna go through and start building this out again. That's the main component. I wanna show you on the, the thinkorswim chart. This is really, again, I think a, a really important way to kind of show it and build it out because we'll build it out a couple different ways. I think that'll helpful uh, help you guys out. Again, just to reiterate and go back, you know, as we go back through 2008, 2008, we saw the VIX get up to about 90. In fact, it had pretty much a couple months of 70s, 60s, 50s, insane volatility. I mean, volatility that many people who have been trading now have never, ever seen in their entire lifetime. Um, and so we'll definitely be shocked when we get to that level. We did have a couple periods even after that where volatility got up into the 40s and to the 50s. But you'll notice that basically after around 2012, except for one day little spikes here and there, uh, we haven't seen volatility really, really stay up into these upper ranges, 40s, 50s, et cetera. We've had some some shockers for sure. We got up to 50 back in uh, uh, February of 2018. We got back up to around like 35-ish in December of 2018. So we've had some big spikes. And what we're trying to do here is we're trying to use this component, which I just went through, to take advantage of some of these, these little kind of peak spikes in volatility. I don't think we'll take advantage of every single one of them, but the goal is that we know volatility is going to spike. So how do we set up a position that creates minimal drag that gives us long volatility exposure and allows us to take profits from that position and remove the position while still maintaining some of the really, really far, far tail risk, which is ideally what we're going to try to do uh, with this strategy. And I think we can obviously accomplish it. Um, so that's how we're going to work it. So if we go actually to the VIX itself, I want to uh, basically recreate this strategy, if you will, and, uh, and basically build this strategy like it was brand new. So I'm going to build it in here. I'm going to just for a minute, just hide all uh, positions that we have. And that way we can kind of build it out together like if it was brand new for our portfolio. So first things first, we're gonna target around 120 days. That really doesn't change for us. Uh, this could be 125 days, could be 117 days, 115 days. You basically wanna give yourself about a five day variance within that 120 day range. But again, everything that we're doing with VIX Hedge every single month is on a 120 day basis. So we will have the first month will be the 120 days that we'll target. And then next month we'll have the next contracts or the next set target another 120 days when those contracts come uh, come over to, uh, to a closer expiration. At that point, the first contracts that we have will now be 90 days from expiration. Then we'll start trading the third month out. And that's again, three months from now, we'll start trading again the next 120 day strike or days to expiration options. The contracts that we traded the second month out will now become the 90s and the contracts that we traded the first will now become the 60s, etc. So we're just going to ladder this position out over time over these four months. That's no different than what the original uh, strategy was to do as well. Same concept. We're going to have continuous ongoing exposure to long volatility. It's really the only way that works. You can't pick and choose this stuff because we don't know when these things are going to happen. We don't know when these black swans are going to kind of rear their ugly head. So we want to continue this whole process about four months out. So once we get to about four months out, now these contracts here become the 30 day contracts and these become the 60 and these become the 90 contracts. And what happens once you get to the fifth month is that these contracts no longer exist. So now you start all over again with 120 days and now these become the 30s, et cetera. And it just continues to stair step its way uh, into the future. So as we go out, we'll only need to have four positions on for every uh, or four expiration periods on at any time. When the most recent expiration period expires, the next one basically comes online and we enter that new position. All right, so let's start building out this position together. Like I said, I think the key here is just starting with that 
first short strike that's going to be at the 80 delta and for our luck today basically that position was right at 80 delta which was the 17 strike uh, call option so that's the first one that we're going to sell that kind of sets the stage for everything and lets us know how much premium we're allowed basically to spend in this entire strategy now the next component to this and we do this for you today already but the next component to this is going to be basically to start stair-stepping your way out in time and see you know how wide you need to get in order for this thing to turn into a credit what i would do and what i would suggest you do too is i would start with something just a couple dollars wide so in this case i would start with like the 20 delta i'm sorry the 20 strike calls and i would also buy the 19 strike uh calls as well now you can see what i'm starting with is i'm starting with the outside component of the call spread and so this is the sell and the buy, right? We sell one of the 17s and we buy one of the 20s. Now we have to figure out a way to hopefully see that if it works, we buy the 18 or the 19. And remember, we have to buy something in here, the 18, the 19, the 20, something inside this range. We cannot, if we're gonna use these long 20 strikes as the basis, we can't buy the 21s, the 22s, the 23s, 4s, 5s, 6s, etc. Okay, so it's got to be inside this range that we have to purchase those options. Now you can see on the bottom of my screen here, as I load up this strategy, if I sell the 17, buy the 20, and then also buy the 19, which is inside, I'm still left with $185 debit. So, okay, I try to buy the 22s, or try to buy two of the 20s. I'm still left with the debit. So at this point now, what we have to do is we have to start rolling not rolling out, but we have to start analyzing different strikes on a progressively outward basis. So we start slowly moving this out. And again, this unfortunately is the a little bit difficult part of this right now that we have to do this manually. In the future, we have bots going and we have automation. We can do this on the back end with automation. But right now, what you would have to do is do this, which is what we have to do as well, is start literally stair-stepping this thing out and figuring out where it works. So in this case, we move out this strike. We go out to the 21s, we have the 20s that we're buying as well. So now we're uh, basically pinning everything around this long strike. So we're trying to buy the 20s, the 19s, the 17s, the 18s, trying to figure out what actually works, right? So the 20s do not work. So we try to go down to the 21s or to the 19s. Obviously those don't work. The 18s, they don't work either. You see anytime that I mess with anything around 21 or under, it still creates a debit cost for us, okay? So now we have to keep going out on this strike. We keep going down to the 22s. So now we have have this long option. Again, everything still stays short with this uh, 80 strike. We don't really move that one. That one doesn't adjust. Now we're buying the 22s, trying to sell the 21s. Okay, now that debit's starting to come down, right? So we keep moving this thing out. We buy the 23s and we buy the 22s. That debit's pretty close now. So now we have a debit of $35. It still is not cost less yet. So now we move out one more set and you can see that now we end up with a credit scenario. So today we ended up getting filled at a $5 credit right now or $10 credit right now it's filling at about a $5 credit. So do you notice how we literally started with just a pair and then we moved out to the next pair and then we moved out to the next pair and then we moved out to the next and to the next until it worked. That is the way that you have to do this and the reason is is because as you go further out it starts to increase the risk of a single contract, okay? And I'll show you that here in a second so you can understand that, but that's why we do this. Now in this case, the way that we calculate the risk on the position is very, very simple. We basically take the difference between our short strike, no different than we would on any other uh, credit spread. We take the difference of our short strike and the closest uh, long strike that we have, which in this case is the 23s. That difference is $6. It's very simple math, right? and we subtract out of that the credit that we collected, which is $10, right? So the $6 minus the 10, sorry, the 10 cents equals a risk for each of these of $590. Now, if we had collected a bigger credit, our risk would have been lower. If you decide that you want to reduce the spread width, and this is where I said it could get a little bit subjective, I will continue to go after a credit. That doesn't mean I will always get a credit, it means that I will generally get a credit. If it's a debit of $5, I might take a debit of $5, but I will generally try to get a credit. And I'll try to get a credit around zero because you'll notice you can actually go out even further than this and you can go out to the 25 and to the 24 and you get a nice big old credit, but what did you do in the process? In the process of doing that, if you 
had sold the 17s and you had the closest call strike was at 24, now you've basically created a position that's $7 wide and your position now has uh, only a 40 cent uh, premium. So you're basically left with risk of around $6.60. Notice that we've actually increased the risk in this position, uh, even though we're collecting a little bit more money. Again, you can choose to do it that way if you want. Just understand the wider that you go with this thing, the more risk you're gonna be taking on. Hence my suggestion to start closer and slowly work your way out until you get that first credit level scenario. So in this case, like I said, what we're doing here, and let me just move these back to their appropriate level. Uh, what we're doing here is we're buying these two options, which give us long exposure. We're selling that first option to basically finance those, uh, and we're left with uh, still a little bit of risk. However, when you actually look at the risk profile of this position, which is where it gets really, really interesting, when you look at the risk profile of this position, what you notice is that if the VIX does stay generally low, so stay in this case around 17 or under, it doesn't cost us anything to have this hedge on. And that I think is a really cool thing. That's the, the part of this strategy that you'll notice uh, that really makes this thing very, very viable to me is this costless feature below that short call strike. And the reason it does is because not all times will we see the VIX actually spike. In fact, it'll go through many periods where it just stays low. You look at basically what happened all of 2017, the VIX practically stayed under 15 the entire year, right? It was kind of one of those really, really crazy years where the VIX stayed low. So for all intents and purposes, you should have had a hedge on during that time period had we had this particular component hedge on, it would not have cost us any money to go through that entire period. It would have been basically a free hedge the entire time had we continued to put it on for costless like, like it is right now or basically a small little credit. So that's the reason why we wanna have this thing basically pay us a small credit. If you wanted to do a small debit, like I said, you could just understand that you know small debit is, is going to cost you money if you get to expiration but we prefer to have the small credit. This also makes it a lot easier because as you get to expiration, all the contracts are effectively out of the money and so you can basically just close those contracts or let them expire if you want to and they're cash settled. So where's the risk in this position? Obviously it doesn't go without risk, so it's not a free lunch. The risk in this position is obviously that the market has a volatility event where the market has increasing volatility and comes and lands right inside of our bucket right here. Basically, like this is the valley, the valley of death, if you will, the valley that would actually cause us to have a full loss on this hedge position. Now, I will go back and say that the number one rule in trading for us is making sure that your position size is appropriate. So please, please, please do not blame me if you over allocate on this position. Understand that this is the risk right here. The risk is that the market comes and lands right at your long strikes, basically right between 23 and 24. And at that point, then your call option that you're short would be in the money and your long options would be worthless. Basically, that's where the max risk happens. That's where that $590 in this case is our risk. This is where $590 of risk starts to reveal itself, okay? This is where it comes from. Like I said before, if you decided you wanted to, for example, take in a bigger credit because you were feeling a little bit, you're feeling a little bit good, you wanna take in a bigger credit, understand that the bigger credit you just took in, and I just readjusted this whole payoff diagram to the 24.25, now taking in a $40 credit, this payoff that you took in here, or that you're potentially gonna take in if the VIX does stay low, is directly offset by the fact that you now have an additional risk on the top side of $660. Now again, this is your choice what you wanna do. I'm just kind of laying out the groundwork of where the risk is and how you can basically see what that risk is. Remember, this is $7 wide spread, less the credit that's received, that gives you a total risk on this trade of $660. To me, personally, I would rather take a small credit knowing that this thing is a hedge. It's meant to be a hedge. It's not meant to be a money maker. This is not a profit generating strategy for our system. This is a make sure that if the market starts falling apart, we have a backstop basically. So I would not take the higher credit. I would take the more narrow spread that has less risk um, and still gives me a costless opportunity. So I would still take 
as we did today, because that's what we did today, I would take this one, okay? Now notice that this payoff diagram also has long tail exposure. So this is what I like about this a lot, is that you know our real risk in this strategy is that we pin this thing at expiration or near expiration somewhere in this valley. Basically that volatility goes up right before expiration and stops right dead in, our tra in the middle of it. Now, I don't know how likely that's gonna to be to happen. It has happened before, for sure. So it hasn't been that we haven't seen volatility go up and spike and land somewhere around that range like it did here, right? So here's an example where volatility spiked and then it kind of settled right around 20 before expiration, right? This is another example where volatility has gone up to 30 and kind of settled around this range. So it obviously has happened. Please don't under assume or over, uh, I guess, assume what I'm saying here, but I think that it's probably more unlikely than not that it stops at a high level. You know, the VIX tends to rally up to levels and then it contracts back down when volatility kind of comes back out of the market. So the reason that we are going to use a uh, profit taking level on this strategy is specifically to avoid the opportunity, hopefully in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases that the stock or that the VIX lands inside of our basket or our valley here at expiration. So as I mentioned on the trade commentary back on the website, what we're gonna be doing on this thing is we're gonna be taking profits at about a 1.5X level. So again, this is what we found in back testing actually works best. Not necessarily one, not necessarily two, definitely not anything three or above, but a 1.5X profit taking level. And we're gonna be setting this profit taking level on the basis of the long call strike in the middle. So this is the, the real one that's kind of like running the strategy on the long call side, it's this one right here. This is the one that retilts the entire portfolio uh, to a long position in volatility. So whatever that long call strike is, for our example, this is the 23 strike, we're gonna set the profit taking order on this thing to basically trigger off of this 123 option. Now, there's a couple different ways you can do it. I'll show you here in a second uh, how you could basically set up these orders in advance if you wanted to. I will probably just be setting up the single order on the one, on the 23 call option and then basically running things from there, seeing how things go, uh, seeing how much volatility there is in the market, how much exposure to the downside our portfolio needs. But again, just to be clear, we are taking the profits triggered and based off of the middle long call strike in this position. And the idea here is that you can see this purple line is the daily P&L line. And the idea is that if we do get a massive spike up in volatility at some point during this expiration cycle, uh, if this strategy starts to pay off, we don't want to let the strategy decay in value back down to this line. So remember, the difference between the daily P&L, which is this purple line, and the P&L at expiration is all time decay. And time decay is not your good friend when volatility spikes. When volatility spikes, you're gonna need to take profits on this component of the VIX hedge uh, in order to make this thing work. Because if you don't, then you need that much more of a volatility spike, which again, we just rarely see those big, 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 big spikes. So we're gonna play this thing pretty opportunistically. We're gonna you know, take this thing as, as it's meant to be, which is this short-term spike in volatility. We're gonna you know, profit from that move up in volatility. And again, once we have that component off, let's say that, that we remove this thing and this thing is now profitable and we remove this component, what's left over is still that doomsday hedge, those super, super far out long call options. So we're not doing this without having that component in place um, as well, because we don't wanna be naked or unexposed to long volatility in this, in this environment. So like I said, if we were setting up this trade, or actually we can just do this now from the trade that we set up today. Um, the trade that we set up today basically was this one here, which is the same thing, this 23 long call option. We had bought this for $185 today. Uh, so you can see that that's the, the price of the inside middle strike. Again, that's this strike right here that we're kind of keying off of. So if I take $185 and I multiply that by basically 2.5, and the reason I do 2.5 is because we want to take 100, uh, 1.5x of that price, not necessarily that that price is going to just simply uh, go up by one. So if I multiply it by one, I get 185. If I multiplied it by uh, 1.5, which is just a 50% return, I would basically uh, get this thing at 185 times 1.5 would be taking profits at $2.77 when the value goes up to that level. 
But instead, what we want to do is we want to take 150% return, not just a 50% return. So we basically take 185 and we multiply that by 2.5 and we're going to be taking this contract off whenever it reaches 462. So what I would do and what I'll do even just right now is I'll create a closing order for just that middle strike. And I would just do this and let it sit as a GTC order. Now this is actually really important because a lot of trading that we do on Option Alpha, many times we may not use the GTC order because we're watching the markets, we're kind of you know picking and choosing our entries, picking and choosing our exits. When it comes to volatility, volatility spikes can be very erratic and they can be very fast. And so as a result, I will 100% all the time use a GTC order for that middle strike. Because if we get even a fraction of a moment, a flash crash if you will, of the market going down and volatility spiking, that order should be able to be hit if it's liquid and if people are trading it, right? So that's what I would do for this position for sure. So again, I'm just setting up the closing order. I go right back in, I say create a closing order, but I'm only gonna sell back that middle call option strike, the one that's at 185, and I'll put my price at 462 in this case. So I'll go 462.5, I think is what it was. Yeah, 462.5. These contracts, I believe, only trade at $5 increments. Um, so I'll just round down to 460 in this case. I'll change this to GTC and I'll go ahead and place this order and say confirm. So now I have that working order in place for this particular strike. Now again, everything is keyed off of this inside strike here, this lower call strike, if you will, the one that's basically holding up all this long volatility exposure. Playing through scenarios in my head, if we get to expiration and none of these things actually work and the market is lower, then obviously most of these things are gonna expire worthless and out of the money. So you can choose to reverse them back. If there's any value to them, you can choose to let them go to expiration. They're all cash settled, so they won't settle for any value. So that's the scenario number one. Scenario number two is that the VIX basically closes somewhere in this basket right, right now. So somewhere in the range that we would look at at expiration where, uh, let me go back to actually the chart here, it's probably a little bit more prevalent. But if the VIX closes somewhere between 17, in this case 30, so somewhere in this basket, we would obviously deliberately, because we have call options that here are in the money, so ITM, if the VIX were to close inside of that range and we did not find ourselves in a profit-taking scenario, then what I would do is I would close these contracts, all of them, uh, and reverse all the trades and try to get whatever values left in those contracts. If the VIX closes obviously north of this, then we have a profit at expiration. We take that profit, whatever that profit is. If it's not 150%, that's fine. If it's 10%, that's fine. If it's 20%, that's fine. You just take the profit at expiration, obviously for any VIX close over that level. I would, I would assume that if we actually got to that level and it was close to expiration, we probably would have already hit our profit target, but may, maybe not. Maybe we didn't uh, hit it and it was a slow grind higher, okay? So that's scenarios of how I would play out the strategy. Um, I think I've kind of, hopefully beat this this dead horse, if you will, a little bit too much tonight, but I think it was worth it. Um, I'm trying to think through if I have any scenarios in my head of, of how I would adjust things, and I really don't think I covered everything with debit spreads, with credits, uh, you know, reducing the, the strikes down so you could do a debit if you want to do a debit. Again, I would not do the debit, but but you could if you wanted to. It would reduce risk for sure. Um, it's up to you how you want to play it, but but I think that really kind of covers that, that first main component and how we would use this strategy. Again, if you guys do have any questions on these two components after watching this video five times, uh, let me know. And I truly say that five times. Please, please watch this video a number of times before you uh, submit questions because I know we're going to get a lot of questions on these. And, and the purpose of doing this video is to help me and the team out with making sure that we um, that we do everything correctly and uh, and give you guys as much information as possible. All right, so next component of this thing, and then we'll wrap up with uh, overall allocation for them. The next component of this is, again, that same VIX long call option that many of you are used to because we started last month. Uh, this is very simple. This is probably the simplest part. So part two is this doomsday uh, type hedge component. And this is simply long calls at a 10 delta 120 days to expiration. Really about as simple as that. So if we go back to the chart here and we have this uh, position here where we uh, want to get into these 120 day options. You can see that the ones that were at the time closest to the 10 Delta were these ones here, which were the 45s. So we got into the 45s. This is just as simple as just buying these contracts and holding these to expiration. There's nothing really crazy about this. Uh, we don't necessarily want to take profits on any of these things. If we find ourselves in a major market meltdown, we'll, we'll circle back and we'll revisit that, right? Then we can decide what to do. But 
the goal in having these ones on, these particular contracts on for us is that these things give us the super, super long tail end exposure risk uh, that we need for our portfolio. So in my case, I did a number of these contracts. We did three of these. I'll tell you how I kind of arrived at that number again. But you can see now that we add both of these components in here uh, to this position, you can see how it tilts that daily P&L dramatically higher for this thing. So this really creates, again, this opportunity where on the far end of the spectrum, should volatility absolutely go bananas, uh, this small, small, small position could pay off, you know, 100x basically, you know, in some cases. So um, that's what we want. We want that long tail exposure. And me personally, I'm willing to pay a little bit of money to do that and to have that in my portfolio. It gives me the ability to be a little bit more aggressive with my option selling and be a little bit more aggressive with uh, overall allocation uh, during the times where things are not crazy. Kind of gives me a little bit of a backstop, okay? So how do we come up with these numbers? Uh, first things first, when I had said originally that my goal for this thing is to be uh, every single month that we do this on a rolling basis, um, we're gonna target about a 25 uh, percent, 25 basis point uh, risk allocation, okay? So in my case, this again looks something like this, and I'll just draw this out so you guys can see this. 25 basis points of risk for my portfolio is going to be allocated for a single month's expiration. So very much like this month's expiration that we just did. So the next month will be the same thing, 25 basis points, the next month 25 basis points, the next month 25 basis points. So in total, over the course of the entire four month period, so once this thing is fully built out and it continues on a rolling basis, you'll basically have about 1% of your portfolio allocated to this hedge. It's a very small, small hedge uh, to be allocated, but it does a lot of good in bad situations. That's the purpose of it. So this 1% is based on risk. And I think that's a really important component to talk about here because remember that this position here, uh, and in particular, this first component of the hedge, which is this bull call ladder or bear call ladder, whatever you wanna call it, this laddered component, this thing has $590 of risk only if the market falls beneath uh, or falls in between that range that we had talked about earlier, basically 17 to 30 or so. So if it falls near those two exact strikes and pins it, then we have $590 of risk in the position. We are still gonna base our position size on that risk. That's the right thing to do. I know a lot of people are gonna change this up and they're not gonna base it on that position size. It will come back and burn you in the end. I promise you if you over allocate to this and if you think you're gonna like game the system on this, it's not gonna work well. Please base your position size on this number here. So this means that the 25% or 25 basis points, 0 0.002 or 0025 of our account 25 or a lot of that portion has to be accompanied or accounted for, sorry, in the 590 that we have here. So in my account right now, roughly a $300,000 account, this gives us 25 basis points in that account, it means that I can allocate $750 of risk for every month for this strategy. So 750, 750, 750, 750. Does that make sense, hopefully? So again, all I did was I take my account I times it by 0 0.0025, which is 25 basis points. That tells me how much money I have to play with max risk for a single expiration period. So now that I have that 750 here, what I can do is I can immediately subtract off of that 750, the 590 that was associated with this first component, that laddered component that we just did that component had $590 of risk at expiration if it was the worst case scenario. So remember at this point that that $590 of risk is only if it pins in between here. There is a high likelihood that many months during the year, maybe not all months, maybe some months, some years and other months, not so many months, but there's a high likelihood that actually because we did this thing for no cost, that it doesn't actually cost us $590. In fact, because it has to pin at, five, at uh, 23 and 24 to actually reach the max loss, 
it's very likely that this thing will cost us much less than 590 and in many cases it may not cost us anything if the VIX doesn't go up. So I am being overly cautious, as I should be as a trader, overly cautious in assuming that every month that we allocate to it, I'm assuming we always hit max loss. That will not be the case, but that's the assumption that I'm gonna run after because I wanna make sure I position size accordingly. After we do this and we have the 750, we subtract out the risk of the first component here, what we're left with is we're left with $160. Now, $160 is what you can use, this basically leftover money, if you will, to buy these long wings, okay? These long, out-of-the-money doomsday options. So in our case, we only bought three of these today. We did not use all $160, but you come somewhere close. You don't have to be exact, right? But you probably come somewhere close to doing that. So uh, we bought three of these contracts. You could have bought four if you wanted to. It's whatever you want to do in that case, but that's where the money comes from. If, for example, these this uh, first component, this latter component, cost you $650, right, of risk, just based on how the pricing worked, you had to go a little bit wider in order to get a credit, that means that you'd only be left with $100 of potential money to buy these long out-of-the-money wings, okay, these long doomsday 10 delta 120 expiration options. But you still want to do that. To me, you still want to buy that long wing protection because you need that in case the inside laddered contracts uh, hit their profit target and get removed. You still need long volatility exposure in your portfolio. Again, just look at this. If I were to take off this inside position, I still have all of that long volatility exposure working in my favor. Okay, It's going to be a drag. That component is going to be a drag for sure. And that's okay, I'm willing to do that because I think it'll make up for itself at some point down the road in spades when the market just blows up one day and, and it will, something will happen and we'll get volatility back up to 50, 60, 70 at some point. So, uh, so that's what I'm willing to do with that position. Now, the next question is, what if you don't have an account size to do that? And I think that this is a, a very important question and I think one that I wanna tread lightly in addressing because I, I would look at this completely different Again, if I was in the, this situation, let's assume you have $10,000 to work with. And again, you be your own judge of how you adjust this. I'm just using this as a, as a baseline. And please don't email me and say, what if I have $9,000 or $5,000? I'm assuming you can adjust this scenario to, uh, to, fit your, to fit your account size, okay? But if you have a $10,000 account, and I'm saying that basically I'm using 1% of my account every four months to execute this head strategy, 25 basis points every month for four months, 1% total. That would basically be in a $10,000 account, you'd be using about $100 uh, over the course of four months to use this strategy. Now, that's how much your account, based on what I would tell you as percentages, how much you'd be willing to allocate or how much max you'd be willing to allocate. Obviously, that means you cannot do this first component because this first component requires $590 of risk, which is almost 6% of a $10,000 account. I would absolutely not suggest doing that because I don't think that that's the purpose of this strategy. This strategy's purpose is not to be a money-making profit center. Hence, I don't think you should allocate 6% or 5% or 3% of your account to it. I think it should be something around 1%, okay? You do what you wanna do, but that's what I think you should do. So if you can't do this strategy, then what do you do with that $100? I think that $100 just easily dumps right into the doomsday hedge. I mean, ultimately, that's what it should be there for. So if you have a small account and this is the only money that you have to live, you shouldn't be trading, right? You should be living off that money. I'm making a very broad assumption that the $10,000 you've worked for and you've earned and you've saved up and you're willing to start investing it and trading it, I think you're better served just using the doomsday hedge on a small micro fraction position size maybe it's even one contract every two months maybe it's one contract every four months and you keep a rolling basis of every four months you do a contract but if i were you and if i was in that position i would at least have some minimal tail exposure that doesn't go over one percent and i think that frees you up a little bit to again do what i'm doing with my account which is to trade um, and sell premium and not have the fear of a black swan event coming in and knocking out everything, okay? So again, if you have a smaller account, you really you really can't do this component of the strategy. And that's a little bit more complex anyway, but you can. 
what you need to do is you need to make sure you have that super long tail risk on and that's really the basis of what you can do you could tr you could try to do this one if you wanted to but it does have a lot more risk and you're going to fall into that valley at some point which means that murphy's law is going to apply what's bound to happen and if it's bad is bound to happen to you right and i just don't want you to be a part of that so um just position size appropriately i mean look you do what you want to do this is obviously my my take on how i'm doing it with my portfolio not a suggestion of what you should do or how you should do it or whatever um, so that's how I would approach it if I was in the same, uh, scenario and situation. Okay. So I think that pretty much wraps it up. Um, I know we've gone over quite a lot in this video. This is, uh, by no means, uh, meant to be, uh, something that was necessarily easy to digest. If you are a new trader, uh, there was a lot of things that we talked about, but I think that we really kind of covered the basis here. Uh, I would encourage you to go back and watch this video five more times if you need to. Um, because there's a lot of stuff that we talked about here that you might not have caught before or might have glanced over. It will make more sense as we go through. It's actually a very simple strategy. Uh, many longtime traders, if you're a very experienced trader, which I know a lot of people in this community are, you guys will look at this and you'll be like, oh, that's a, a simple way to approach it. And you'll think to yourself, oh, it's pretty clever, pretty pretty crazy. It backed us well. So um, I think that that's a, it's a really cool way to look at it. So uh, hopefully you guys enjoy this. If you have any questions, let me know. And until next time, happy trading.